sad when that song goes away. I mean, we've only got one more week of this Practicing Jesus series, but man, that song puts you in a good mood when I come up here, which is always helpful, uh, especially because today, guess what we're talking about? Money. You're excited. I'm excited. Yes, I love this in the front row. So, so yeah, Practicing Jesus, week 11. We are on the final lap almost. Next week, we'll close this thing out. But today is looking at the spiritual practice of generosity. And this entire series has been looking at Jesus' invitation for us to come and to follow him, to become his apprentice so that we might be with him, become like him, and do exactly what he did. And, and so we are extending that invitation to everyone. And then these spiritual practices are God's gifts to us in order to draw near to him and to carry out kind of the mission that Jesus has for us. And today is about generosity. So I wanna start actually with uh, an old story about elephants and rope. Uh, I'm not sure if this is a true story or not. I tried to do some research this week and um, inconclusive whether or not this is a true story. Uh, but there's an allegory that goes with it that I think is important to kind of set the tone for where I wanna go. Uh, elephants, rope, and their trainers. That's where we're gonna talk about. So evidently, baby elephants, when they are young, are actually trained to stay in the same position by a small piece of twine. Now, it's probably a little bit larger than this. I couldn't find anything else. But the trainer will put this rope around the ankle. I would probably say more of a cankle with an elephant. Um, around the cankle of the elephant. And then the other end goes to some type of a stake that's been driven in the ground. And when the baby elephant is young it's not strong enough to actually break the rope. And so from a young age, the elephant begins to become conditioned to believe that it can only go as far as the rope will allow. Now it's fascinating, and you know this, right? Baby elephants become behemoth elephants, but evidently trainers still would use the same tactic because they have been mentally conditioned, the elephants have at a young age, and so they still will use this twine to keep the elephant in a stationary place when it's a full-grown elephant. And, you know, if I was able to go up to an elephant that's full-grown and was contained by a piece of twine, I don't know if you do this, I would be like, Mr. Elephant, there's a problem here. <laughs> like, how are you allowing that piece of rope to contain you? Mr. Elephant, like, you are so free. <laughs> like, you are so Free, like that, that doesn't have to contain you. Like you can break out of that whenever you want. Just move your cankle and go, right? But this condition in psychology of, of known as learned helplessness is something that this elephant believes that it cannot go any further than the rope because it's been conditioned to believe that, even though the reality is other than that now later in life. It makes me wonder for all those here at Normal Campus, as well as watching at Bloomington and online, is it possible that many of us are elephants in twine when it comes to how we manage our money? That we have been conditioned to believe in our culture, which is predicated off of consumption, accumulation, and greed, that that is the way that we are just to handle our finances and even though when we get older, like we have the power to break free and to live free and generous lives, we are elephants in twine and we still find, us, find ourselves shackled and bound, closed fisted, not willing to openly give. Is it possible that we are elephants in twine when it comes to managing our money? That's what I am wanting to look at today. And I wanna tell all of us from the very beginning today, we are full grown elephants. Full grown elephants. And so break your cankles free today. And let's be generous. All right? Will you stand with me? And I want to read our passage. This is in Matthew 25, verses 14 to 30. We stand in honor of God's word. We also stand in anticipation because the word is living and active. 
And God wants, I believe today, to speak to us through his word, to meet us in our hearts, and then ultimately to open our hands. Matthew 25, picking up in verse 14, says this. It says, again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and to another one bag, each according to his ability. Then he went on a journey. The man who had received five bags of gold went at once and he put his money to work and he gained five bags more. So also the one with two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the dug a hole in the ground and he hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and he settled accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share in your master's happiness. The man with two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I will not put you in charge of many things. Come and share in your master's happiness. Then the man who had received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I knew that you were a hard man, harvesting where you had not sown and gathering where you had not scattered seed. So I was afraid. And I went out and I hid your gold in the ground. See, here it is, what belongs to you. His master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. So you knew I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed? Well, then you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has 10 bags. For whoever will be given, for whoever has will be given more and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. And throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That doesn't sound very Jesus-like. Let's pray. God, in this time, I ask that you would open our minds and our hearts and our hands to God what you'd have in this practice of generosity. God, I, I pray that if there is, sometimes there's this taboo or this notion, God, that this is, oh, this is what churches talk about, or all they care about is money or money. I pray, God, that we would have open hearts so that we would look like you and live like you. And we know you are generous. And so teach us that today. In Jesus' name I pray. Everybody said? Amen. Amen. All right, you can have a seat. So this parable that Jesus teaches is one of what's known to be 38 core parables that likely Jesus taught to different people in different locations. 16 of the 38 core parables that Jesus ever taught dealt with money, wealth, or possessions. That's roughly 42%. So to know that almost half of the parables that Jesus taught somehow talked about or gravitated in the direction of money, wealth, and possessions tells us that Jesus thought that this was an important topic to teach on, which begs the question, why? And the simple answer of why Jesus decided to spend 42% of his parables talking about this topic of money was because Jesus knew that money was a spiritual issue because money is a heart issue. Money is a heart issue at its core. And because Jesus wants to have supremacy of our lives, which starts in our hearts, he said, I'm gonna talk about that and I want us to address that. Interestingly enough, Jesus said it another time. He said, be on guard against various types of greed. And, and when he said that, he, he says, there's not just kind of one size fits all of greed. It's, it's subtle and it's sneaky. And greed is one of those things that gets into our life that sometimes we don't even pay attention to it. I mean, have you ever, this is fascinating to me. Have you ever noticed how like you can point out the greed in someone else, but how often do you ever look in the mirror and be like, man, I'm greedy. Right, I mean, do you ever do that? Like we can see it in other people, but we fail to label ourselves as greedy at times. And Jesus says, be on guard against that. Jesus said it this way in Matthew 6, 21. He says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Connecting this idea of treasure, some translations say your investment, where you put your money, you'll be able to find your heart. In many ways, Jesus is saying like, it, it, all of us have this trail behind us. 
And the trail behind us kind of shows us our heart's priorities. That, that I can get, like if you're old school and you still use a checkbook and you have a register, I can look at that. Or I can do a digital printout of, of your bank accounts. And all of us, based upon our investments and our purchases and our acquisitions, we have a trail behind us that shows where our heart is and what matters most to us in our life. Now, we don't like to think about it like that, but generally where our greatest investment is, you'll find your heart. So the question is, where is our heart in the realms of the kingdom of God? And our generosity quotient regarding that. And what I wanna do in this, this message, and I, I wanna really look at some different principles that I think really unveil to us God's heart and his economy of how he wants us to go about managing our money. But before I jump into that fully, I think it's important just as, as, as you get to know me and me get to know you to kind of share briefly a little bit of my financial journey so you know that I am, I am with you in this and not preaching at you in this, all right? So I, I grew up in a household where I feel like my, my, my parents for the most part were pretty... Uh, just, just wise with the money management, but I don't recall them ever spending time talking to me about different forms of economics or, or, or the detriments of compound interest. I didn't know what that meant. And so when I went to college, um, I was one of those college students that got a credit card solicitation. I was like, this is amazing. I can get whatever I want, not really pay for it, budget off of minimum monthly payments, at the time, I, I loved uh, playing guitar, so I'm gonna get some guitars, not just one, but plural. I need an acoustic and an electric. Gotta get some great amps, some good foot pedals and all that kind of stuff. And I began just purchasing stuff on a credit card. It was great, because I was just budgeting off a minimum monthly payment, not knowing this thing called compound interest. Oh, want a new car? Sweet, take a loan for that. College, thankfully my parents helped a lot, but still had about $20,000 there. At the end of college, I was probably $5,000-ish in debt credit card-wise. I had a car loan probably for about that as well left. Uh, I also had $20,000 in school debt and then an extra $4,000 for this May term China trip that I took my junior year of college. My girlfriend at the time was going on this trip and I was like, sweet, let's go to the Orient together and I'll pay for it later. So when I come out of college, I've got about thirty-three, dollars $34,000 of debt. Well, then I meet Jamie. And guess what she had? Nothing. Don't I look appealing? <laughs> and, and so she didn't have debt, no school debt, no car debt, no credit card debt. And, and all the while, I became a Christian my, my freshman year of college. In terms of generosity, I was kind of a tipper. It was like, oh, if I have a little bit left over, boom, I'll throw some money in here and there, but that's about it. I meet Jamie, she's got no debt, and she has this practice of generosity. Well, our first Christmas together, we weren't married yet, this came to a head. Because, right, I mean, I, I, I love giving gifts, and I was like, I want to get her a great gift. This is our first Christmas, and we're going to get married, you know, I want to. And, and here's the thing, right? Anytime you give a great gift, let's be honest, you expect a great response. So I'm thinking about this is gonna be a great response, it's a great gift. She loved photography, and so I bought her a camera. And they had this great deal at Best Buy. It was like, you know, buy now, pay later, zero interest, zero percent interest, all this stuff. And I was like, this is great. So I give her this camera. And she, initially she's like, oh, you know, this is a great response, here it comes. You're definitely gonna love me now. And she's like close to like being so excited. And then she stops, she asks this question. How'd you pay for this? Why are you asking that? This isn't a great response. <laughs> How did you pay for this? Well, you know, they had this great deal, blah, 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 blah. And then she said this, you gotta take it back. I was like, what'd you say? You gotta take it back. I was like, no, 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 no. That's not how it works around here. You like the gift, it makes you love me more. Like, no, you gotta take it back. And I, it was probably one of our first fights. And I remember going back to Best Buy, taking this camera back, and something shifted in me. Where it was like, I've said yes to Jesus a few years ago, and I've begun to give him supremacy of my life in every realm but this. And I gotta figure this out. And so I, 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 you know, I, I, in a humble way, came to her and said, you know, I'm sorry, let's, let's figure this thing out. Her dad is extremely savvy with money. He introduced me to this guy, not in person, but Dave Ramsey in Financial Peace University. 
we started like doing the, the Ramsey principles. And over the next three and a half years, we're like, we're gonna get this debt paid off. Now, what's wild is our first really big like payment towards debt was you know how you get money for like weddings? People are generous, give you money. We paid off that China trip with my ex-girlfriend with our wedding money. <laughs> I'm married to a saint. I'm telling you, I'm telling you. I, <laughs> I, I remember um, we didn't have couches for the first six months in our house. We sat on the floor. We'd say this thing like we're rich in love, you know, <laughs> like didn't get curtains for a while, but, but we, we began to pay steadily this debt down. And we made the decision when this all started, like we've got to start being serious about giving. And we're just going to start. We, we feel like we're going to give 10% and we're just going to go there. And I'll never forget after about three and a half, four years, making that last payment and being like William Wallace, like freedom. It was amazing. And we've never been in debt since. And something changed in my heart at that moment because I started to see tangibly when God calls us to live a certain way and the promises he makes in that direction of generosity coming to, be for, like, coming to fruition in my life, it gave me greater validation and substantiation. This is true. And so generosity and giving has now become one of these, it's just a passion of mine because I've been on the other side of it. I've been the elephant in twine. <laughs> and it's like, man, I need my cankles free in this. And so my prayer is that wherever you're at, that we start somewhere today. But I've been there. I still wrestle, be on guard against various forms of greed. I mean, great timing, by the way, preaching on uh, this topic right after Black November. I say November because you notice how Black Friday was the whole month. It was like <laughs> sales were going on. It's like, we're all broke. I get it. But what does God tell us about financial stewardship here? That's what I want to look at, this, this notion of stewardship. Now, stewardship's a, I think it's kind of a Christianese term. It, it's used more in the realms of kind of Christian church. Uh, it's, it's actually a word that can be used in the secular society, but you hear it more in churches. But let me just talk about what stewardship is. Stewardship is simply this idea that refers to the responsible management and care of resources that are entrusted to someone. How can we become good kingdom stewards? To be responsible managers of the resources we've been entrusted with, all right? And this parable that Jesus tells, I believe there's, there's a lot of principles, but I'm gonna look at what I would say are four kingdom stewardship truths that, I, that I, I feel like are so important for us to have anchored in our hearts, which will then open up our hands. So I wanna, I wanna break this parable down and share these stewardship principles because all of us are called to be kingdom stewards. So the first thing that we see, the first truth is this, we are owners of nothing, stewards of everything. Now, this is such an important concept that, that we are owners of nothing, stewards of everything. Everything that we have has been gifted to us by our creator. Psalm 24, one says, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. The scriptures say like, God is the bestower of every good and perfect gift that we have been given. But many of us succumb to what is known as an ownership mentality, believing that, that we are the actual owners of the possessions that we have, the money we have earned. And we say things like, well, I've worked hard. I've earned this money. I saved up to buy this. And so we tell our kids when they're young, don't say things like mine. But then when we're adults, we still say it's mine. <laughs> but the truth is it's not yours. The effort that you gave to work hard came from the energy that the Lord provided to you. The intellect that you have to actually have the job that you have to produce the money you have, that brain came from your creator. The skill set that you have that somehow got you this opportunity and breakthrough came from your creator. Therefore, we are owners of nothing, stewards of absolutely everything. God is the owner of all of it. And in this actual parable, the master is the God figure. And there are three servants that receive different forms of money here. And so it's important to see that the master owned the money and then entrusted the, stu the, the, the servants to steward it well. And so we have one servant who received five bags of gold, another one, two bags of gold, and then this other one got one bag of gold. Now, just to kind of get an idea of what kind of money we're talking about here, I did some math. In the original translation, where it says bags of gold, it's actually the word talents, which was a form of money or a denomination of money in Jesus' day. One talent is equivalent to 34,000 grams of gold. Based upon inflationary rates today, 
you can buy one gram of gold for $85 per gram. Meaning, when you take this one talent or this one bag of gold, it would be equivalent to $2.89 million. This isn't chump change, people. Let's just round that up to $3 million for the sake of making it easy math. So here's one guy, he's got five talents or five bags of gold times three. He's been in $15 million. The two bag gold guy, right? He, he's got $6 million. And then even the one bag gold guy is given $3 million. None of it is their money. And it's extremely generous for the master to give them any money, much less 15 million, 6 million, and 3 million. How many wish that was your story, Right? And so he gives them this money, and then it says he goes off on a long journey. In that culture, one talent was equivalent to roughly 20 to 25 years worth of wages. This is a lot of money. And so what we need to see is, first and foremost, they are owners of nothing. And they are called to be good stewards. What are they going to do with the resources that God's entrusted them with? They're stewards of everything. The master was generous and gave it to them. The master gave them the money and said, according to their abilities. So he positioned each one of them in a, in a place that they could succeed, right? Some people in here make more money than others, have more stuff than stuff. And that's not the point. The point is that each of us have been positioned by our maker in a place of opportunity to be a good steward. And for all of us, because we're owners of nothing, stewards of everything, what we have been given is a gift, which makes the maker himself, God, the generous one. So in that cultural context, when Jesus starts off this story, the question that would begin ruminating in the minds of the original hearers would be this, how do I or how do we respond to the generosity of the master or the generosity of God? Because our God is a generous God who gives to each one of us. It starts with knowing we are owners of nothing, stewards of everything. The second principle is this, the second kingdom stewardship truth is someday all of us will give an account of our stewardship. This parable tells us that. These, these guys, eventually the, the master comes back from his long journey and he's ready to settle accounts. What did you do with what I entrusted you with? That's, that's the question, that's the audit. And, and so this, this, this plays out in such a, I feel, so, man, my heart goes out for the third servant when we get to him in just a minute. But just put yourself in this situation. Master comes back. He's gonna, what, did, what did you do with what I gave you? Five bag gold guy, 15 million man, says, I had five. I did, we don't know if he invested it, if, if whatever, he was industrious with whatever he had and his five turned into 10. I had 15 million. Now I got 30 million for you. And then the master comes back and is like, dang, great job. Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with little, so now I'll bestow more upon you. Come and share in your master's happiness. Second person, right? He was given $6 million or two bags of gold, two talents. He made his six, doubled it to, to 12, presents it to the master. And the master says the exact same thing to him. Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with little. Now we will be bestowed more. Come and share in your master's happiness. What's important to see with these first two servants is what, what they were entrusted with, they did something with it. They did something rather than nothing. Sometimes owners do nothing because we don't want to lose what we have been given. But a good steward says, I have been entrusted with this by my maker. So how do I leverage this in such a way to be generous and to be wise and to do something rather than nothing? And because they did something rather than nothing, they were commended and they were celebrated by the master. Now, what's extremely interesting is, is when you get around Christians, and especially when they start talking about things like someday going to heaven, we quote this passage so frequently, right? Have you ever heard people say like, oh, someday, someday God's gonna say, well done, good and faithful servant. And we love that. We're like, oh, those words would be so good to hear. But have you ever heard that the context to those words, well done, good and faithful servant, are in the realm of money management and stewardship? 
We use it in realms of getting through circumstances and persevering and staying in the line or whatever the case. But did you know, well done, good and faithful servant is an acclamation that goes to those who are financially wise, good stewards of what they've been entrusted with. Would, would you hear those words? Would the trail behind you lead the master say, well done, well done. And, and sometimes, here's the thing, sometimes we can maneuver ourselves around this and it's like, no, 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 I'm generous. I'm generous with my time and my talents. And then we'll talk about the treasure later. This, this passage has nothing to do with your talents or your time. It has everything to do with, with what resources you've been given. Some have been given more, some have been given less. Have you done something rather than nothing? And I would encourage us, what does it look like for us to become kingdom-minded and saying, with what treasure God has bestowed to me and trusted me with, how do I leverage it to be generous, to make impact, to give, to, to, to steward my money well, to impact people's lives, right? Like we're, we're sitting here in a church, so I'm obviously an advocate of believing what God does in this place and through this place in the community, that if you go to church and you grow in church, that I think a part of your investment should be with the church. Um, this, this, is, this is a place we want to invite everyone to come and, and be a part of, but we also, if we all stay just consumers and never become contributors, I think we miss out on the glory of God and what he wants to do in and through our life. I think that we have to be honest to assess the trail behind us and start to say like, okay, if Starbucks gets more money than Jesus, there might be a problem with that. Can I take that a little bit further? If my monthly subscriptions to God knows what these days receives more money than the kingdom of God, there might be a problem with that. If my restaurant tabs or alcoholic purchases exceed what I give to the kingdom, there might be a problem with that. I'm, I'm gonna really like just step on all of us here. If our Amazon purchases, <laughs> no, that's too radical. I won't say that, Never mind. No. <laughs> You're tracking, right? They did something rather than nothing. Now let's go to the third servant because someday all of us will give an account of our stewardship. The third servant, oh man, I feel so sorry for him because I'm just wondering if he's watching and he's like, oh, this is terrible. Because he comes up and, and five bag gold guy shows off and he's got 10 and two's at four and he's like, I still got what you gave me though. Here's your one. Which honestly, let's be serious. Like he didn't lose it, didn't waste it, just didn't do anything with it. And what does the master say? The master, which is the Jesus figure, God figure in this passage, says, you wicked, lazy servant. Now, lazy, I can understand, right? Like he's a bum, he didn't do anything. He just like left this in there, he didn't do anything. I, I, I can at least understand, okay, he's lazy. He didn't think about ways he could be generous or impact other people's lives, whatever. He's, he's lazy, but wicked? Wicked? I mean, it's, it's not like this is taking place in Boston. It's like, hey, you're wicked smart. Like, this is like, wicked is bad. And he still says, you wicked, lazy servant. How is that possible? Perhaps it's possible because our view of wickedness, like we would say, well, it would have been wicked if you had taken the bag of gold and hired a hitman and killed the master. It would have been wicked if you had taken the bag of gold and like went out and maybe squandered on prostitutes. Or maybe if you just completely wasted on who knows what, we say that might be wicked, but, but to do nothing? Is it possible that when it comes to the kingdom of God, God looks at what you had the potential of doing with what he entrusted you with versus what you actually did. And when you have done nothing or squandered what you've been given, that is wickedness in his sight. I don't know how else to interpret that. It appears that poor stewardship is deemed as wicked. James 4, 17 says this, anyone who knows the good that they ought to do and chooses not to do it, sins. That's called a sin of omission. We're familiar with sins of commission, 
This is like, well, you know, I know the good I could have done, but I didn't want to, or I just didn't. I know this is hard. I know it's hard. And I preach this to myself still every day, even though that we've moved to this place of feeling like we're free and generous and blah, 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 blah. Don't think that your pastor isn't like loving the Black Friday deals. Isn't trying to figure out how he can continue to like, ooh, this, 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 and this. Like I'm there. But when I see this, it helps. That kingdom stewardship will be commended while poor kingdom stewardship will be condemned. Truth number three, our view and trust of God shapes our stewardship. Because the question is, why, why did this third servant not do anything at all? And he, and he lets us know. He says, I was afraid. I was afraid. I, I thought you were a hard man, harvesting where you not sown, gathering you not scattered seed. So I was afraid and I hid it. I think it's so important for us to ask ourselves, how do we actually view And what is our trust of God? A.W. Tozer, who's a pastor and author, said this way. He says, what comes to your mind when you think about God is the most important part about you. I think that some of us, and this isn't condemnation, this is just reality. Some of us fear wanting to open our hands and be generous because our perception of God and belief of God is that he's not this God of provision, not a God of abundance, not a God of generosity, but rather we feel like God may be unjust because I didn't get what I deserved or someone else got what I thought I should have got. We see God to be unreliable, untrustworthy, unkind. Maybe he's temperamental in your mind, frugal, stingy, withholding. Like, what do you think of when it comes to God? And If we don't think God is trustworthy, we'll never be willing to entrust him with anything, much less something of great value. And I I just wanna encourage you, because I think that this servant here, I applaud his honesty. I was afraid, I thought this about you, which really isn't true because I mean, he gave you $3 million. (laughs) He gave you like 60 years worth of wages almost. Like, what if you began to take an, just an evaluation of how do you view God and, and tell him that? I struggle trusting you in this. I've seen money mismanaged, so I, did, I don't wanna be generous with the church. I don't wanna be generous with this organization or this or that. I don't, I don't want, I, I, that, that homeless person is probably gonna waste the money that I give them and buy it on, spend it on something that's not, not appropriate. And that you still want me to be generous. Like, I don't, I don't really think that's wise, God, <laughs> Right? Tell him those things and ask him to begin to shape your heart because giving comes from a heart. Like this isn't me trying to persuade you with a great sermon. God has to do something. When I went back to Best Buy and I began to take that back, something something shifted. The spirit was like, you're missing something about me. You're, you're, You're thinking that you're not getting all that you want or that I can't provide or that these other things are more meaningful, so you're gonna go after to possess them versus having full possession of me and watching what I do when you put your heart fully in my hands. Scriptures tell us, and, and they validate that our God is a God of abundance, of provision, of resourcing. He's faithful and he's a generous God. Sometimes, It's not even that we have a negative perception of God that that skews our view and trust of him in the realms of our money management. Sometimes it's because we have too flippant of a view of God. Because we're like, oh, Jesus would never say wicked, lazy servant or throw that dude out where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. Yes, he did. Like, you gotta hold both sides of Jesus here. Like, yeah, he's a nice guy and full of grace, but man, he is full of truth. And he's also like, this means something here. And so sometimes we're very flippant, like, ah, he won't care. What if he does? What if he cares so much because he knows that this is a matter of the heart and he wants you to live a life of freedom that can only be found when we say, I will be generous and joyful versus hoarding and greedy. But we can't even see it because we're elephants entwined. The fourth 
truth here is simply this, that stewardship is the pathway to greater generosity. This, this parable, it's interesting because once he, he kind of comes down on this third servant, he then says, give that one bag of gold to the dude who had five and made it 10. Give him more. Which when you read that, you're like, wait a minute. Is this a passage about the rich getting richer? That's not right. Why, why are we stacking a deck here, God? I don't think this is a passage about the rich getting richer. This is about the faithful being entrusted with even more because they've been faithful. This is why from a young age with kids, I I highly encourage you to begin to set within their minds, give first, save second, live off the rest. If you hear nothing else today, give first, save second, live off the rest. The society and culture will say, live off everything first, save just because you need more later, and give if you got anything left over. It's completely upside down. You give first, you save second, you live off the rest. You get three buckets, you say, start with 10% goes to God, 10% goes to savings, live off 80%. Do that with a kid and generally like, God only gives 10%, that's crazy. And you're like, that's the heart of God, but we, <laughs> we don't live like that. But in this passage, the ones who were entrusted with the five and the two and did something with it, were faithful with what they had. And so God said, I'm gonna hand you more. This is not a prescription to say, how do I get richer by giving more and God's gonna give me more and all that kind of stuff. God knows the motives of the heart. But whether or not you make $25,000 a year or $250,000 a year, are you being faithful and generous with what you have been bestowed? Because the same celebration is given to the guy who made, right, 30 million, verse 15. He doesn't say to the one who had two bags and made four, man, you should have worked harder and made the same amount as the guy who went from five to 10. They both get the well done, good and faithful servant. So God's not looking at the quantity. He's looking at the, the quality of your faithfulness. And as we have quality of faithfulness with what has been given, I believe God bestows more and it gives you the opportunity to continue to be more and more generous and to grow in that through the course of your life. And what would that look like? If a distinctive trait of your life and a distinctive trait of Eastview Christian Church was one of faithfulness with whatever we've been given and to continue to be faithful, be generous over and over and over again. And I, I just want you to know as the pastor here, I take great, um, I'm humbled and I'm scared and I'm also excited. It's like all of this, it's like a cocktail of all those things. But God has allowed this church to steward almost $9 million. That's, that's unbelievable. I'm coming from a church that we were at $1.75 million. I thought that was insane. I remember when we first planted the church and I was just trying to, hey guys, can we get to $10,000 a month as a church? But no matter what with that 10,000, the first part, we're giving it away. We're gonna make sure we're wise and have savings and then we'll do the, what we can with ministry. And it seems like, you know, this is, it just, God has allowed us to continue to move forward. And so now to be here, What would it look like if we stewarded that amount of money to make great kingdom impact in this church and beyond in this community? That's why this Christmas offering is such a big deal because it's all given away to make impact in people's lives. It's an opportunity for us as a church to say, we're not just about ourselves as Eastview. Can I tell you again, I don't care about Eastview. I do, but I care about the kingdom. I care about the ways and the will of Jesus being exhibited in the community. And I believe that people turn their heads when they see the kingdom people living kingdom stewardship lives, being generous and saying, we want to give so that you would see the generous God that we serve and he wants you to experience his generosity. This is about people looking to Jesus. And I'm with you. And I can't wait to see what God wants to do through us together. Some of us, oh, 
We're like this. And we're like, I don't know how to break free. And I'm just like, you're a full grown elephant. You're a full grown elephant. And so take just the first step and break free and faith with the next step and the next step and the next step. And I believe the Lord will bless you with freedom, joy, abundance. And the blessing will be, yes, it will impact people's lives through your generosity, but guess whose life also gets impacted significantly as well? Yours, yours. So I wanna invite you, would you take your communion elements? Generosity starts with understanding where generosity came from. And the greatest example of generosity and of giving is when our God gave his one and only son. And so we wanna just, before we talk about what our response is and gratitude of being generous, we wanna receive the generosity of God. So if you would, would you take this piece of bread, this cracker, and this cracker represents Jesus's body that was willingly on his behalf, broken, crucified, pierced. Like he gave his life to die in the place of all of our sins, including our sins of greed. He says, I love you in spite of all of those things. Take and eat and remember, I died to forgive you of your sins. Let's eat that together. And in the same way that we remember our sins being forgiven, we need to remember that God has given us grace to come into his presence, grace to change our hearts, to spur us on towards generosity, grace to move in and out of our lives to, to help other people come and see Jesus. But it's by grace alone, not by the amount of money you give, not by how sacrificial you are, because ultimately it's his sacrifice and what he's given, and that's what starts everything. And so let's take and drink and remember Christ's blood being poured out to usher in the invitation of grace. Will you stand? I want to pray for us. We're going to sing. And um, I know I get a little worked up with that. <laughs> I'm passionate about it because it's hard not to be passionate about something when you were an elephant in twine and you break free, you're like, oh, life's way better on the other side of this rope. <laughs> and so God, I pray right now, you stir in our hearts as a church, stir in our hearts as people. God, for some, maybe it just starts with the mind of helping us understand, God, that we are owners of nothing, stewards of everything. God, that you would help us begin to, to want to leverage our resources and our giving, God, in a way that, that, that is generous. And, and no, God, someday you're gonna take an account of our stewardship. And God, we don't wanna have fear drive us because, oh, we, we, God's gonna give an account. Like, we wanna be excited to say, Lord, look, you gave us this and look what we did and look at the lives impacted. And so, Lord, that we would be a church that, is able to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with what you've been given. Now you're bestowed more. Come and share in your master's happiness. God, if we have skewed or off perceptions of who you are, which deviate our trust, God, would you help us maybe yet again place our trust in you and say, Lord, help us see you for who you are and embrace your generosity. And God, as those things come together, would you help, Lord, us, please, God, be good stewards and be entrusted with more to be generous with more so more people would come to see Jesus. And the God that our hearts would be even deeper tethered to Jesus as well. God, as we sing, may this song be, the words be our prayer. And we thank you, God, for your great generosity in our life. We pray this in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen, amen. amen.